Thank you. I would like to start with Afghanistan. Mr. K, you have been, together with your colleagues, tried to build a bridge in Afghanistan and it seems to be widely reported. Uh, how much do you think these kind of infrastructure is likely to help with the local community? Well, um, a bridge is easy to, to imagine in all of our minds uh, what it looks like. But when you really think about the impact that it has on people's lives, um, allowing children to go to school, whereas many girls would not be allowed to walk the distances that would require them to walk all the way down the river and all the way back up, when it allows people to carry um, goods and services across the bridge, uh, cutting their um, commuting time and delivery times by, you know, by, by, by half or, you know, uh, it makes a huge impact on mm. what um, the choices that people have in their lives, the practical impact on making people's lives better through increasing the choices that they have. Um, that's what development is about. That's what UNDP stands for. And that's why we're so excited about um, the various infrastructure investments that donors yeah. and hopefully also with China uh, moving forward will be able to uh, bring about. I see a lot of passion in your eyes, uh, Douglas, when you're talking about the changes going on on the ground with your work, uh, UNDP in Afghanistan. How, Leon, what about for you? I mean, you as uh, the UNDP for Asia Pacific had uh, went to launch this, the Sustainable Development Goals in Afghanistan. You work also earlier in some of the Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, you know, Iran, Pakistan. How much do you think this infrastructure thing, connectivity, is really likely to change the picture, or is too much exaggeration? No, I think uh, uh, infrastructure has been proven to be a key driver of economic growth and the prosperity. I think that there, there will be no exception when it comes to the bridge and the uh, road initiative. And uh, if we talk about bridges, Afghanistan sits uh, in the middle of uh, major countries in the region, right? And uh, uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, China. So it's a bridge to Central Asia and the further down to Middle East. And I think uh, uh, the fact that uh, last year, uh, the freight train from chi China has arrived in Afghanistan, mm. and uh, the flight between uh, Urumqi and uh, Kabul has uh, restarted are all indications that uh, this bridge road is going to expand. And with the expansion of this uh, connectivity, there will be more uh, growth and more jobs, more pr prosperity, I believe. Well said, Haoliang, but where does the money come from? I mean, that's always the ultimate question, isn't it? You said in the speech at Columbia University uh, a few weeks ago that now the only, ten, only 1%, in fact, uh, foreign aid coming from uh, GDP of uh, many developed economies. Earlier, it was 10%. So money are getting ever smaller. So where would the money come from for all of these uh, connectivity building? Only from China? Is that going to work? Uh, it's a, a very important question. Where will the money come from? Uh, according to Asian Development Bank, the infrastructural investment needs uh, uh, for Asia Pacific, uh, every year is a 1.5 to, to 1.7 trillion dollars. So it is clear that uh, money from uh, the multi-development banks and the money from from the public sector is not going to be enough. That's why uh, the partnership is going to be important. I think that's at the essence of this Belt and Road Initiative. That is to encourage partnerships on a voluntary basis between China and the participating countries and all you know, other multilateral institutions, such as ADB and also the AIIB. And uh, uh, I think the key is to uh, find uh, projects that will bring benefits, mm. tangible benefits to the people as soon as possible, not only in major urban centers, but also to population live in uh, rural areas. The such as in Afghanistan. But Douglas, some would say, partnership really on what kind of projects? I mean, in Afghanistan, you have a lot of resources. The locals have a lot of resources on extractive industries. But some would say, we don't need partnership about this because others are going to get our resources away rather than uh, letting us uh, enjoy the benefits of our resources. What would you say, Douglas? Well, um, I think UNDP in Afghanistan holds a special position among all the UN agencies and all the providers of, of aid to this country. We are the largest provider um, 
where donors, uh, uh, more than any other agency, has provided us with the financing to uh, add on our technical assistance, our experiences from other parts of the world, the best practices that we have identified, and how we can bring to bear those lessons here in Afghanistan. And I think what donors and, and the partnership um, with UNDP ultimately stems from um, our, experience in, in our experience in managing funds. Um, we, are, we are operating in a highly insecure, high-risk environment where, as you mentioned, you mentioned the extractive industry. Um, well, you know, the, they're, they're, they believe that there's more than $1.3 trillion of minerals under the ground here in Afghanistan, mm. which will provide a, a huge amount of long-term development support for the country. However, um, developing the systems to manage the, 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 the industry, the funds, um, ensuring that the revenues and the profits are, 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 are spread and so that you have an inclusive growth process which includes people throughout the country and yeah. that the, the wealth is not concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, there aren't many agencies that can manage that, that have the experience in supporting governments to develop these systems. And I think as we move forward, um, you know, the, the security situation is the, the most, the foremost um, uh, a risk to development at this point. However, um, with the Brussels conference, there was a big development conference um, about uh, right. in September of last year where donors throughout the world set the agenda for the next four years. And clearly, um, the focus now is long-term capacity building. How can we support well, the country, the government, as well as the private sector to develop the systems to manage these high potential growth long, industries? Long-term capacity building, that's the key word. And also, you use the key word, Hao Liang, about partnership. But the question is, mm -hmm. is BRI, Brett Belt and Road Initiative, really the most favorable platform likely to be used. Are there other platforms that is better or at this point it seems more promising? Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, on this uh, question of uh, 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 extractive industry, I think the key here is uh, to have a transparency right, in the government you know, uh, system. Mm. And uh, in this uh, regard, I think progress is being made for public services. And also, uh, you need the uh, infrastructure, you need the uh, power, you know, uh, sta uh, uh, stations to generate the power for industry. So there's also progress in this regard. On the peace front, the government has signed an agreement with one of the uh, uh, groups that are fighting the government. So progress is being made, but a lot more progress is needed. Right? So in terms of uh, platforms, the Bridge and the Road Initiative is uh, a platform to uh, encourage uh, multilateral cooperation, right, to uh, through connectivity, through uh, investment flows, through people-to-people -people exchange, to again provide the opportunities for growth and for prosper prosperity. Now, uh, uh, another international uh, framework that is accepted accepted by all countries in the world mm. is this sustainable development agenda for 2030. That's right. Uh, the framework of sustainable development goals. I think uh, what we need to do now is to try to create synergies to align the objectives, the vision, the visions of the uh, pr uh, uh, bridge and the road initiative with the visions of the sustainable development goals so that the, what is seen as a Chinese initiative is actually in line with uh, what is widely accepted uh, as an international cooperation framework for mm. development. That's an interesting point that you just made, Hao Liang, because uh, even though it started from China, the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, it has become ever more inclusive to have more players, not only international organizations like the United Nations Development Program, but also private sectors and others. Uh, but the th thing is how? Will that be done on time, efficiently, in order to make sure connectivity is going to happen as soon as possible? Hao Liang. Right. I think uh a lot has happened. I think that's uh, the reality. In, term, in terms of agreements, I understand that more than 50 uh, MOUs have been signed between China and uh, other uh, uh, governments. You know. And also in terms of connectivity, I mentioned the flight uh, between uh, China and uh, uh, Afghanistan. But we know that uh, just uh, two, weeks, two weeks ago, or about a week ago, we read the news that a freight train from London was dispatched uh, to China. Mm. Right? And when I was uh, in uh, Poland last year, uh, attending a meeting on Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a train from China has just arrived in Warsaw. So uh, a lot of uh, connectivities are already taking place. I think, uh, and also uh, from what I understand, uh, what I read, 
uh, in 2016, $18.5 billion has been invested by Chinese uh, uh, enterprises and the government you know, uh, in countries along the Belt and Road, you know, uh, participating countries. Mm. And I understand also uh, 160,000 local jobs have been established as a result of this investment. So I think things are happening. What's important is that uh, all participating countries right, are working together to strive for mutual benefits. Right? to look at uh, sustainability, sustainable mm. development. We want to learn lessons from the past so that uh, the future growth stimulated by all development initiatives, including Belt and Road, is sustainable and inclusive. Right? I think that's a key word, sustainability and inclusivity. That all sounds great, but Douglas, for example, in the country of Afgan Afghanistan, even coming to our program at late at night is kind of dangerous. And thank you for doing that for us. But the question is how to guarantee security, transparency, and also stability in a country such as Afghanistan, where you are for the UNDP, in order to make sure all of this is going to happen and money going to be spent well and smartly. Well, um, how the money is spent well and smartly really is the key in, in terms of our cooperation with China right now. Um, I had a meeting with the Chinese ambassador here uh, in Kabul and the embassy uh, with my program team a couple of weeks ago. And it's clear that um, even though China has primarily uh, provided aid to Afghanistan through bilateral channels direct from China to Afghanistan in the past, um, the government, the Chinese government is currently seriously considering how to broaden its approach to include the multilateral channel more here in Afghanistan for one reason, because they want to benefit from the United Nations experience in managing funds in such a highly insecure, high risk environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we've had programs and operations throughout the whole country for many, many years. And um, that experience in terms of how to account for each dollar, yen, euro, each m unit of financing here is, is no small challenge. And again, um, it, it's going to be interesting with the Belt and Road Initiative to see how we can catalyze China's support, financial, right. and good intentions to practical impact on the ground. And that's our discussions right now with, with the Chinese government. You mentioned a very interesting point, which is, you know, UNDP used to be this donor uh, organization in a way. You provide funding for countries in which you are working for. But now you have turned, Hao Liang, if I remember right, you were talking about this ahead of the Asia Pacific for UNDP, uh, that you have become a service provider. So with this role change, how will be your role, I mean UNDP's role, working on this BRI platform or cooperating with BRI platform becoming extremely dramatic, I would say? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, very important. Uh, UNDP used to be the channel of resources uh, for development in developing countries, but that uh, was uh, uh, the decades ago. And uh, over the last uh, 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 few decades, and the, the importance, the growth of Asia has increased. In the 1950s, Asia's uh, output right, in world GDP is about 10%. Today, it's 40%, okay. and this is going to increase further. So this means that the domestic resources that our governments command for their development has in increased tremendously, and the dwarfs the international uh, ODA uh, that is still important, catalytic. Right? But the point is that our law has to change. We're, we're no longer the source of financing, but with our experience, accumulated experience, our impartiality, we can provide a lot of value added to our governments. That's why we're working with our governments as a service provider to find the innovative and the practical solutions to their development challenges, such as climate change, such as uh, natural disaster risk reduction, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, urbanization, aging, and many new issues. I think uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative, through the signing of the MOU we, uh, with the government, we're going to work with uh, the Chinese government on research, on knowledge mm. about Benton Road, about uh, policy uh, coordination, right. about uh, doing pilot projects right, in Benton Road countries, particularly to ensure that the Benton Road initiatives are in compliance with the social and the environmental standards so that they support sustainability and inclusivi inclusivity yeah. of uh, our common objective.
But you know, Hao Liang, you have got a lot of competition because a lot of international organizations, even under the UN umbrella, want to work with China on some of the points you just mentioned. For example, the World Bank and also some of the other organizations. How are you going to compete with them? This is an interesting question because ever more you see the project get inclusive, more players coming in. UNDP, are you really going to get the key position? I think, uh, again, you know, I think the challenge here is that uh, we work uh, with uh, the Chinese government and all our participating uh, country governments. You know, uh, I think it's important to uh, recognize that we are present in most of the uh, Belt and Road countries in the developing world. So we can really play a role to mm. enhance uh, co uh, a policy coordination and the coherence of you know, uh, multiple developed initiatives. We can work to ensure that the Belt and Road initiatives are part of uh, the t national development planning that uh, actually support national development objectives. Yeah. So we can uh, work with our partners together, not in a way to compete, but uh, uh, in a way that's really coherent for uh, national development objectives. Douglas, you know, you work in Afghanistan for UNDP, but some say this is going to be a very exceptional case. Others say this is going to be a crystallization of how countries in danger and under security uh, threat n could work on a global basis to develop its future, for example, on BRI. What would you say? Do you think this experience can be duplicated in different ways for other parts of the world? Well, I think what's clear is um, Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in Asia at this point in time. Um, and therefore, in China's support to this country, in many respects, can have a much more catalytic uh, uh, multiplier effect than it might have in other countries. Um, the, the openness of Afghanistan to support from China, and not only financing, but also the technical experience and the lessons learned from China, for example, in the area of infrastructure, can have a much deeper and, and, and uh, more profound impact here in these environments. Now also, um, China's been involved not only on the economic and development side, but also on the political side. And over the past year, um, China has increasingly become uh, involved in some of the uh, high-level peace negotiations that have taken place. Now, those negotiations have, have taken a bit of a pause at this point for various other political reasons. But it's clear that China also sees the need and the importance of getting involved to ensure that sooner than later, peace is achieved here in Afghanistan. Because without peace, there can be no uh, significant uh, private sector-led mm. growth in this country. Without private sector-led growth, it's harder for the government of Afghanistan to collect the tax revenues to support itself in the future. At the end of the day, what we all want, China, UNDP, the government of Afghanistan, is for a government in Afghanistan to govern independently to move away from this 15 years of extraordinary dependence that's been developed in this country mm -hmm. so that we have a country and a government that can govern itself in peace, towards peace and prosperity. I see a lot of determination in that answer, Douglas. Uh, Hao Liang, though, as a member of the UNDP umbrella, you have to keep neutrality in a way. And you work with China, if UNDP, on the BRI issue. Does that make UNDP stand in line uh, uh, in the one country against the other countries? I mean, people would also say, you yourself originally coming from China. Are you swaying to one side or the other side? Yeah, I've been uh, actually asked the, uh, this question many times. <laughs> uh, my I, will, answer, I will let uh, you to answer it answer once again. Uh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. No, definitely. I think my answer is very, very simple. You know, I think uh, with or without the NDP, China is uh, pushing ahead with uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, the fact that more than 50 countries uh, have uh, uh, signed a cooperation agreement with China is an indication uh, in itself, right, the value of this initiative. I think uh, what the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, uh, is that uh, it, it is a vision, right? A, a vision for long-term collaboration right, through connectivity, right, through a uh, movement of uh, 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 you know uh, people, right, and the exchange you know of people yes. through increasing investment opportunities to drive for mutual uh, prosperity. That's I think what it is. Okay. Now in this effort, right, UNDP can add value. As I said earlier, we can work with the Chinese partners and. The 
other you know, participating countries, particularly in the developing world, to ensure that the projects of this Belt and Road Initiative yeah. are, are actually taking into consideration of lessons learned right, of, of past development. And also, really importantly, uh, the social and the environmental standards that support you know, uh, 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 inclusivity so that the whole society is benefiting, okay. not just the major city centers right, where investments are you know, in terms of connectivity. I think we can really add value right, to, to ensure that the development is actually you know, uh, welcomed by all, not mm. just the few.